Um, so well, thank you everyone uh, for uh, coming to the Blackboard talk. Um, I know for some of you it's already quite late in the day. Um, so uh, let me uh, first with, uh, start with a, a brief history of our program. Um, so we, we started planning uh, Correlated 20 in uh, 2018. Um, and uh, the point was that uh, this got four friends together. And um, there's no better way, in my opinion, um, to get something fun and productive going uh, uh, than, than getting friends together to do it. Um, so we also wanted to promote uh, various aspects beyond the purely academic ones. Um, in our proposal, uh, the title of, of our program was More Indifferent, so sort of like the title uh, of this talk. And we had actually provided an acronym for it, which was MAD20. Um, I'm not sure whether the veto came uh, because of an obvious reason or because you guys are mod, but I like tw correlated 20 a lot, so uh, no hard feelings. Uh, anyway, so uh, those uh, four friends, uh, it's uh, George Jack Kelly here. Uh, from Stuttgart University, from Stuttgart University, uh, as well as the MPI Stuttgart, uh, Natasha Perkins from uh, University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, uh, myself from uh, CNRS and UNS de Lyon, and Oscar Vafek from uh, Florida State University uh, in Tallahassee. Uh, so uh, we were planning to you know, stay the whole 12 weeks of our program. So our program is 12 weeks. It's one of the, the very long programs. Uh, Natasha had had a sabbatical and all, and uh, we were looking forward uh, to uh, this, which is my impression of the tower room, um, to some nice weather. This is my artistic impression of a palm tree. And finally, to swimming in the Pacific Ocean. Um, when not uh, doing physics. Um, so uh, anyway, this is not how it turned out, but I'm very happy to report that we're having a, a nevertheless a very lively program. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the uh, KITP staff uh, for making it all together, come together uh, smoothly, uh, as well as our numerous participants, uh, some of whom are online uh, with us every single day. And we have a very dense program, uh, and few even have we even have a few regulars from East Asia. Um, so that's basically logging on to hear the talks of Correlated 20 in the middle of the night. So uh, since this is a broad audience, I'll, I'll start with the basics, um, sort of things that our community does before moving on to more specifics of the program. Uh, so I, I used to. Uh, tell my, my non-physics friends um, that um, what, we were, what I was doing anyway was studying uh, materials uh, at the electronic scale. Um, okay, uh, this never flew with my non-physics friends. Now I say I do quantum physics, it's kind of a lie, but at least it gets, um, some further questions that we so often. Uh, I don't know about you guys who are in Mod 20, uh, how you got about explaining to lay people what you do, but I've got to assume it's nothing like what's on your website. Uh, I wanted to try to make connections, but I felt very intimidated. Um, also, I'd like to learn some more because I saw you had a talk on the three avatars, and I thought there were only two movies which I really liked. So if I can hear about the third one, it would be uh, greatly appreciated. Okay. So um, as I uh, just mentioned, the basic principles is that we're actually interested in materials. Uh, in other words, rocks. And um, what a material typically is for us is a periodic arrangement of atoms. So periodic arrangement. And that's really uh, the common feature uh, of basically uh, anything that we're studying. So uh, these periodic arrangement, it can be of different sorts. Here we have a square lattice, um, but it can also be uh, in 3D, in which case we might think of a cubic lattice, or more realistically uh, in real materials, this might look 
actually much more complicated, might actually look like um, the pyrochlor lattice. These, uh, the pyrochlor, as well as the uh, Kagome lattice. No, um, the Kagome lattice. Uh, in 2D, um, those are frustrate lattices and they exist actually uh, in a number of, uh, of real systems. Uh, and of course, I'll be mentioning this uh, later, we also are studying uh, systems on the honeycomb lattice, which just looks like a honeycomb. So, um, and so atoms, uh, we study atoms of electronic or atomic scale. Um, so atoms um, for us are basically just a nucleus, uh, which is uh, for all that matters very often just a positively charged ball and then electrons, uh, which are uh, uh, negative charges and also uh, carry uh, a spin of one half. Uh, there are electrostatic interactions between these, all the constituents here, so the many nuclei that sit at the, uh, at the um, vertices uh, of these uh, lattices I just drew before. And these electrostatic interactions hold the um, hold these uh, all these atoms together in these uh, periodic arrangements. And depending how uh, precisely you pre uh, how you precisely prepare the ingredients together, uh, you might actually end up in a local minimum, so in one of these lattices or in another. So a uh, spatial periodicity is an important feature. Uh, but then given a lattice structure, uh, you can have many different electronic phases. So uh, take, uh, so a material will be one lattice structure. In fact, very often it will be a combination, um, say of uh, several parachlor lattices plus some uh, other atoms uh, all around it. And, and again, the periodic uh, uh, stable arrangement. Uh, so what is of interest to us, you know, typically these structures, they just stay as they are after you've, you've created your material. But what's of interest to us is actually uh, electronic phases uh, of these electrons around these nuclei. So um, for, uh, you know, if you, if you think of in terms of electrical conduction, which is uh, familiar, uh, the most familiar phases to to face to uh, anyone in the world, probably, um, there are two different types. You have um, electrical conductor, electrical conductors, and you have uh, electrical insulators, uh, which means those guys, they don't carry electricity, but they may, for example, otherwise uh, carry heat. So they might be heat conductors while being uh, electrical insulators. So in this case, uh, the electrons, which I'll label this way, um, they move around, so they, they have some velocity, and the kinetic energy uh, is non-zero. Uh, whereas in, uh, and if you do an experiment, you might take a slab of a material, here I'm drawing a slab of a material, say a slab of copper, and you apply uh, some electric field, then you're gonna see a charge current uh, this way, um, and if you had if you add a magnetic field, uh, say out of the plane, you'll get the so-called Hall effect. So these are uh, very famous, uh, very famous um, uh, uh, situations. Now, electrical insulators, uh, actually here, uh, the electrons are stuck around uh, their host atom. Well, let's say they're stuck around atoms. Okay. Um, and uh, the kinetic energy, energy vanishes. Uh, okay. Uh, the electrons, um, and so there, there are several reasons for this. Uh, there can be several reasons for this. So either there's something, a phenomenon called, uh, which is due to band filling. So those are band insulators. That's not very interesting. Uh, however, a more interesting situation 
is when the cause of the fact that they're stuck around atoms is due to interactions, in which case they're typically called uh, MOT uh, insulators. And so um, in that case, uh, um, uh, you know, the situation is actually not boring because while the electrons can move around, um, they, uh, there might be uh, some, there's still orbitals on each site. And the electrons also have uh, a spin. Uh, so this, this actually leads to uh, phenomena such as magnetism or what I might call a generalized magnetism, if I want to think about in terms of um, uh, interactions between um, the labels in the orbitals. Okay. Um, and so what is uh, magnetism? Well, you're familiar with at least one problem. You might remember from your uh, statistical physics class, and that's just the IC model where you have spin halves, okay, on a, on a lattice, and you want to understand the thermodynamic properties of this, okay. So this is the, the icing model. It would have, you'd have a Hamiltonian, which is some J, um, which could be positive or negative. Uh, and then you'd have some on nearest neighbors, labeling nearest neighbors this way, and then some uh, local Z axis, uh, they have some interactions of this form. Uh, so this is, you know, already a very interesting model, especially uh, when you start um, looking at it on the more frustrated lattices, like I mentioned before, such as the pyrochlor or the Kagame lattice. Okay. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, if I keep on, if I stay on the magnetism thread for concreteness, uh, so you have the icing model. Uh, but physicists for the last many, many, uh, so which has interactions of this form. Oh my God. Um, <clears throat> my dad. He's probably going to try again, so I'll... sorry about this. Okay, this won't happen again. Um, so you have uh, the icing model. Okay, which would be, uh, which has Z2 symmetry. Uh, what has been studied on, on models uh, for a long time are, um, uh, are, are the, is the SU2 equivalent of this, which is called the Heisenberg model, which now is also typically near its neighbors, but now it is um, SU2 symmetric. Okay. Um, and uh, these, much like in the icing model, where you have spins which align in opposite directions on the, um, for, um, say, if you have antiferromagnetic ordering, uh, the simplest states, okay, um, the simplest ground states of these models um, are uh, ordered states, so-called ordered states. which means that the expectation value of the spin in the state is non-zero. And this is more or less, you know, um, for this, uh, you don't need any to know any quantum physics. You just need to consider the spins as arrows. It's a very good approximation to just think of the spins as being arrows. Um, so uh, what most of us like uh, in this program is actually to build models which will typically uh, look more complicated than the icing or the Heisenberg model, but which will fit, um, which uh, fit uh, the description of a material. And I'll go back to this uh, in a second. Okay. Uh, and we like to build models even before trying to solve them. Okay. Building, building them is already part of our work. So uh, why might we want more degrees of freedom? Okay. Uh, so why more? 
Well, uh, we're not in the U.S. right now for many of us, so we, we, need a, we do need a reason to supersize. Um, so more is not just a, a more complicated. Um, this thing is one of the basic features of condensed matter physics, okay, is that it's local. So all the interactions are local. Um, typically a very good description of physics uh, is that you use, you have interactions uh, between uh, first and second neighbors. And especially in insulators, this is a good enough a description. Okay. Um, but this is limited uh, because um, there are, so this leads to many constraints uh, because of symmetry. So our models are very constrained. Um, uh, also because we want realistic models, uh, we can't have uh, basically too many uh, spin operators, for example, at once. And so, uh, which means that uh, more uh, implies more variety. And just as an example, uh, just as an example, uh, an interaction uh, is, a, is, a, is a tensor, okay? Uh, and if you uh, use this and then you just write some operators acting on your degrees of freedom, you would have something which looks like this. Uh, if you have an SU2 model, um, u and nu will be x, y, and z. And you can see that if, and, and there will be constraints on what the constants here uh, can be uh, because of symmetries. If you allow yourself uh, for more, uh, then you will allow yourself to have uh, a, a much fewer constraints, and there's a lot more that you can achieve in time. Okay. So, uh, more, more, moreover, uh, what we'd like uh, is we'd love these models to actually host, uh, not only we like uh, to build models, but we'd also like to, them to host uh, quantum phases. That's uh, what many of us are after. Or if they're not quantum, at least they are somewhat exotic so that, you know, S uh, is going to be uh, much less, okay, than one. Okay. So that there are many of uh, quantum fluctuations in them. Okay. Uh, but it turns out uh, that these are very hard to find both in theory and experiment. Okay. Um, but they're par particularly fascinating uh, because uh, they can lead to a macroscopically, of, uh, quantum physics can appear at the microscopic level. Microscopically uh, quantum, so you might have some topological properties. Okay. Sorry. Um. Okay. So. Let me now uh, move on to kind of explain in more detail uh, what we guys are doing, uh, what what yeah what we are doing. So um, one example of these phases in magnetism is quantum spin liquids, and a large fraction of the participants in this program are interested in this. Uh, this is uh, also, uh, so Leon Balance, who's a permanent member here at KITP, is one of the world experts uh, on this. And uh, the first, so these, what these are, um, is they're basically the most entangled phases of quantum magnets. Uh, 
um, they are uh, quantum superpositions. Uh, of um, of, uh, of states. Okay. And this leads to emergent properties. Um, you might call it fractionalization. Uh, where, for example, uh, particles will be, so, you know, an electron might be fractionalized into its charge, which will be free to move, and then a spin half, which will be free to move separately from the charge. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. So uh, one of the first examples of a quantum spin liquid, uh, exact solution, the first exact solutions, was actually provided by Kitayev uh, at KITP in a talk which is actually very well cited, uh, which is online. And, uh, and this was actually uh, the model which is now called the Kitayev honeycomb uh, model. And uh, while, you know, uh, all of us in, in physics uh, love Kitayev, uh, people in our program really love Kitayev. Uh, it turns out that there's been um, every Friday or every other Friday, uh, people are discussing in our program uh, the whole morning about models, both models and materials, uh, which are uh, associated with the Kitayev model. Um, so uh, the Kitayev, the pure Kitayev model, Okay, so pure Kitayev model. I'll explain why I'll see, I say pure. It's actually a model on the honeycomb lattice. Uh, but you see the honeycomb lattice actually has uh, three different types of bonds. Uh, it has the Z bonds, which are all the horizontal bonds on my uh, picture. So this would also be a Z bond, for example. And then it has X bonds which are all the bonds which are uh, oriented uh, just like I drew here. And it also has Y bonds, uh, just like I'm, I'm drawing here. Uh, and it has a Hamiltonian, which looks a little bit like the uh, Ising Hamiltonian, but it's actually uh, quite different. The Hamiltonian takes this form. Um, so here for all the bonds, uh, that are, I'll call that, are in the set AZ, which are, means they are of the uh, type uh, Z bond. So it means that here I and J would be sitting on a horizontal bond. Okay. So SIX is, oops, said Z and then I wrote X. So this is all Z. Um, plus um, some on all the bonds that are of type Y. So it'll be this guy's uh, J, Y, S, I, Y, S, J, Y, plus these guys, which are in the X set, J, Y, J, X, S, I, X, S, J, X. Uh, so not only did Kitayev uh, provide the model, uh, he also actually uh, solved it, and in order to solve it, and he solved it exactly, so it's an exact solution. Actually, I can probably do this. Copy and paste. Yeah. Okay. So, um, So, uh, so uh, the exact solution of this model uh, is providing by rewriting uh, the spins uh, as um, uh, quadratic forms in Majorana and fermions. So writing them this way. So for each spin at a site i, 
Uh, you write them in terms of four different uh, Majorana fermions, uh, where Majorana fermion is such that it has these uh, types of commutation relations, rather anti-commutation relations. In particular, um, Majorana fermions are um, their own uh, anti-particles. And because this is a redundant representation, there is a constraint, which I won't write down here, but there's an extra constraint so that you uh, match the Hilbert space that you are uh, spanning with your Majorana fermions to the Hilbert space that you span with the spin operator. And actually, uh, through this rewriting, uh, you get a quadratic um, uh, Hamiltonian in Majorana's. So basically you get a Hamiltonian, which is just H, which is, well, it's just proportional. So you have to figure out that the factors of two, uh, but it's basically just some popping term, which I'll call AIJ, uh, CI, CJ here of these, uh, the zero ones, okay. Um, and so it's just a quadratic Hamiltonian and it turns out that it has just uh, the phase for basically for JX more or less JY more or less JZ, you actually get a gapless Majorana modes. Um, which uh, propagate in the uh, system. And we, so they are emergent particles, you know, they don't just uh, exist. Uh, if, if there were no interactions in this material, uh, they, they emerge out of the system. And in fact, uh, they are uh, exact particles for this model. And uh, this is particularly exciting because uh, this provides uh, prospects, uh, this provides uh, prospects, um, for uh, quantum computing. Um, in fact, our first talk uh, by Jason uh, was about uh, harnessing uh, these guys in the real material. Uh, and uh, what we have um, also been hearing uh, during our program is some uh, recent uh, developments on uh, alpha ruthenium trichloride, uh, which is a candidate material uh, which realizes this physics, with, well, let's say, which may realize this physics uh, when you apply a magnetic field. In which case, the Majorana fermion uh, I was talking about are not actually uh, in the bulk. Um, it's not exactly the, well, it's not at all the same um, in state, uh, but you still have a uh, presence of a magnetic field. Uh, you have a Majorana edge mode propagating along the edge of the system and the bulk is gapped. Okay. Uh, so um, there are uh, many, many more uh, details uh, about this, um, uh, you know, the, the Kitaev model itself um, is actually never realized uh, in, a, in a real material there are always extra interactions that exist. And these were, for example, proposed uh, by George Tekeli, who also made the connection uh, between uh, this model and how it could occur uh, in materials. Okay. Um, we also have a number of participants, such as Wazir, Hei Yang, and Natasha, who are working very hard uh, to uh, try to figure out uh, what the right um, interactions uh, you know, numbers and, and proper dominating interactions are in these kinds uh, of materials. Okay. And uh, so this material has been around for a while, uh, but in order, you know, we have a, a lot of work to do because uh, in order for a material to, uh, for, for us to say a bingo, we, we did find a quantum spin liquid. We also need to have uh, experimental um, proof, and because those um, systems are 
inherently, the emergent particles are inherently non-local, it is very difficult uh, to uh, get experimental proof from local probes. There's actually for the Kitaev, um, uh, for alpha ruthenium trichloride in this uh, icing uh, anion phase. So that's the one in the field. Uh, the, the proof may come from um, the uh, thermal effect. And we had uh, um, uh, we had some uh, very interesting talks, um, which which give us uh, good prospects um, uh, that this this may have become reality, and further prospects, of course, for quantum computing if this is the case. So. Um, this is uh, one thread of our program. Uh, and in fact, uh, well, this is one aspect of our program, let's say. Um, and in fact, uh, this was uh, uh, a lot of, of discussions and groups and collaborations had already been uh, created during the uh, LS Matter uh, 15 program, which uh, here uh, discussed uh, spin orbit interactions. Uh, so it was also at KLTP, um, and they discussed spin orbit interactions, uh, which uh, these guys have. Okay. So uh, this was just one thread. This is a, kind of the magnetism thread of the program, at least an example of what we've been doing and discussing in this magnetism thread. Um, another thread uh, is uh, Moiré physics. Okay, and this is going to start in about uh, two weeks for us. Uh, we, although we had had a, a couple of talks on this already. Um, so uh, for this uh, system, uh, graphene is the starting point. So if you don't know what graphene is, so uh, just let you know. So graphene uh, is just a honeycomb lattice of carbon atoms. So uh, on the out, you know, just uh, um, it could hardly be any simpler in terms of description of what that means. It's just carbon atoms sitting on the honeycomb lattice, uh, and it is um, it is extremely well understood, uh, at least from the theoretical point of view. Um, it has some gapless um, uh, fermions, which have some uh, linear dispersion. Uh, but Moiré physics uh, is not about, uh, is not just about uh, graphene, it wouldn't be anything new. It's actually about taking graphene and then a second layer of graphene. Okay. Uh, sticking it on top. And twisting. It's very easy as a theorist to, to, to do it. Okay, much less easy as an experimentalist. So um, what this gives okay, is this kind of pattern. And this is a Mori pattern. So um, what you see uh, is actually that you uh, recover some almost quasi-periodicity. Well, quasi uh, okay. uh, some quasi-periodicity. Uh, but now, so it's periodic again, which is what I mentioned we know and love. Uh, only here, the unit cell has about uh, of order 10,000 atoms if the twist angle theta is about 0.1 degree. Okay. So Moray systems are, um, now people are studying other types of Moray systems. It's not necessarily just uh, two sheets of graphene that you can twist uh, one on top of the other. Um, people have, have looked at, at 
the, you know, not just two layers of graphene, but maybe three layers of graphene. We also used, looked at other kinds of types of materials, and at least in theory, also looked at other types of lattices. And depending on the type of lattice you have, your emergent new lattice, so in the case of the honeycomb lattice, uh, you see that you get an emergent uh, a triangular lattice. Uh, if you have a, a different um, a different original lattice, then you'll get a different pattern. But what is quite remarkable uh, was, so this, the fact that it's periodic, actually, uh, we learned about this and, and uh, had been uh, studied. Um, one of the first ones was actually uh, Alan uh, McDonald, uh, from whom we'll hear a talk um, uh, later in the program. And uh, what they had uh, predicted um, was that a fascinating phenomena actually emerged out of this. Because indeed, it might sound a bit strange, you know, to take a sheet of graphene, take another sheet of graphene and twist. Okay. Uh, but the exciting thing is actually that you get uh, out of this, you get fascinating phenomena. Okay, so uh, graphene, um, if you have just one sheet of graphene or maybe two, um, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, electrons, if they, they can move around and they'll have some finite velocity, they're at least slightly excited away from the Fermi energy. Uh, but this is not the case in, uh, in, in Moray systems in, in twisted bilayer graphene for some twist angles. So one thing that we like to do, uh, so in order for me to explain where this fascinating phenomena comes from, let me go back to one of the things that we actually like to do in condensed matter physics. So what we like to do is we like, often like to compare the kinetic energy uh, of the electrons uh, and the interaction, the typical interaction uh, energy. Uh, so let me call this K, for example, and let me call this U. Uh, and this is that when you, we talk about the kinetic energy, this is typically the quadratic part uh, of our interacting, um, sorry, the quadratic part of our Hamiltonian, whereas uh, the interaction energy is beyond a quadratic, so it's um, it's a uh, Non, not directly uh, soluble. And uh, what happens is that when uh, U is much greater than K, so when the interaction uh, interactions dominate, uh, one can get uh, strongly, uh, you know, strongly, so-called strongly correlated uh, phases. So a uh, strong, strongly interacting limit. And uh, and these are a qualitatively uh, different from um, from non-interacting system. Um, and uh, you know, it's not so. Uh, so in graphene, for example, this is not at all the case if you have a single sheet of graphene. But what happens, uh, what uh, Ellen McDonald and collaborators uh, told us was actually in twisted bilayer graphene. So this guy over here. Okay. Um, for some twist angles. Um, then uh, k equals zero, and if k equals zero, no matter the size of the no matter the size of the interactions u, uh, then you actually get uh, you actually you find that all interactions are important. So you find yourself to be in the strongly interacting regime, um, no matter the size of the interactions. So typically in carbon, you don't actually expect interactions to be very important, but if the kinetic energy is very small. Uh, then this uh, helps you compensate the fact that their interactions, you know, on an absolute scale would be quite small. Uh, what we want to know, uh, of course, so now we know that the interactions are strong. 
are strong. Uh, um, as a theorist, you might want to know uh, which ones win. Uh, which ones compete even? Um, and is there some more extraordinary phenomenon that comes from the fact that actually all these interactions are important? And in fact, as always in condensed matter, um, the most interesting part is actually what the experiments tell you, the experimentalists tell you. Uh, and actually experimentally, and we'll hear from uh, many of the experimentalists um, who uh, very quickly reproduced the first experiments by uh, in Pablo Harrier Herrera's group. Um, uh, so some uh, tour de force experiments where they actually found, you know, out of graphene, which is a conductor, um, they found insulators, superconductors, uh, and uh, many other very interesting phenomena, such as anomalous Hall effect, uh, et cetera. Okay. Um, and uh, one interesting aspect of this is, for example, people are wondering because for, you've probably heard of the uh, uh, high TC superconductors, which we still don't understand. We still don't really understand why, uh, where the superconductor, oh, you know, well, all the details and, and subtleties of the, of the conducting and superconducting states in there. And there's actually a hope. Uh, that uh, because uh, we believe in the high TC superconductors, interactions play a very big role, and this is also the case, that perhaps understanding this uh, a priori much simpler system, which is it's just carbon, okay, that will help us understand um, uh, understand uh, high TC uh, superconductors. Um, are they in the same class? Are the cuprate superconductors and these guys that are found experimentally in the same class? Um, and uh, are there, uh, if they're not in the same class, which might be even more interesting, uh, are they even more exciting? Even more exciting phenomena. Um, and actually, I believe this is the case. Uh, there is, uh, for example, many of these experiments find uh, what's called spin and flavor, uh, sym spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, uh, you know, this is starting from the fact that there's actually a fourfold um, degeneracy. Uh, well, of local, yeah, the local Hilbert space uh, is approximately a fourfold uh, degenerate. Uh, and so this brings us to uh, back to our own program uh, because uh, this is actually uh, the sort of things we've been studying uh, from the beginning. Uh, to conclude, just, uh, just a, a few more words about the last bit of the program, which is the four, first four weeks we talked about. I'll just say uh, two words. Um, we uh, had lots of discussions about a more itinerant part, what we call the itinerant part of the workshop, uh, where there were uh, solids uh, uh, with uh, multiple orbitals, and so multiple bands. So more complex, um, superconducting order parameters, uh, and in particular, uh, uh, well, or I'd say 
pneumatic, which is um, rotation symmetry breaking, for example, sought to exist in the iron-based superconductors, and nematicity is actually cutting uh, across the whole program, magnetism, moiré, uh, and this itinerant part. So thank you very much for your attention. Great, hey, thank you, Lil. Let's everybody give her a round of applause. So we definitely have time for questions. So just unmute yourself and ask away. So uh, Lucia, you didn't mention uh, holography uh, in the Kataev model. Is that being explored in your program? Uh, not that I know of. Um, yeah, our program, I don't think, has so many people who do this sort of thing. At least I don't know anything about it, and for sure there has not been any talk so far on this. Probably not a Kitaev pro uh, model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Can you explain the logo of the uh, of the program? Oh. Yeah. Uh, sure. That's nice. Um, so the logo of the program is um, uh, so this is related to the magnetism part of the program. So um, and well, I don't have a copy of the logo here, uh, but it's basically a honeycomb lattice. on which uh, there are some loops, okay, like this, except they form letters and they form KITP. This was no accident. Um, and so where this comes from, uh, actually, uh, is because I, you know, in order to illustrate the Kitaev, the magnetism part of the program, I talked about a lot about the Kitaev model. Uh, this has, uh, well, this has this, this very nice model, uh, and it involves uh, several uh, orbitals, and so a large local Hilbert space in some sense, but then that has been projected onto something which is just an effective uh, spin half. Um, and I mention this because I think it's really uh, the biggest uh, interest of, of many participants in magnetism here. But there's another thread, and we'll hear about it more uh, this week and the next, uh, which is um, when you have both uh, orbital degrees of freedom and the spin degrees of freedom, um, but now they are not... Um, they are not projected onto... Um, onto an effective spin one and a half. So maybe they have uh, SU4 symmetry, or maybe there's SU2 cross SU2. Um, and what you can do with this is you can form, uh, with some models like this, you can form, for example, Haldane chains that fluctuate on the lattice. And so um, maybe if you're lucky, they can form, uh, they can look like KITP when they order. Great, thanks, Lucille. Any other questions? Oh, I have another one. What happens oh, if, the, if the, oh, was there someone else? Yeah, George. Uh, Lucille, maybe it's good to mention that uh, you know, logo was formed after the program was accepted. So the fact that it says KITP didn't influence the decision of the committee. <laughs> yeah, it's a very good point, George. So Lucille, my question was, what happens if the uh, 2D layers buckle? Uh, well, in fact, they probably do already. Yes. Um, so there is some, you know, so in fact, this, the, what the 
two layers of graphene on top of one another like to do is they like to form the so-called Brunel stacking. So they like to be aligned uh, in this way. Which looks nothing, uh, you know, like a lot of the, so it's, it's indeed the case in some regions um, here, if you can see. So these regions here, um, they have this Brunel stacking, but in a lot of the, uh, so these, this is stable, but in a lot of the other areas of the lattice actually, um, they deform. It's not the, the most stable configuration. It's not this Brunel stacking that is going on. Uh, and so the lattice uh, probably relaxes to this. And some people have mentioned that this, you know, this, this could lead to some uh, different effective model and things like this. But I, it, it's a, yeah, I don't really have much to say about this. Thanks. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Lucille. So next week we have uh, Jeff Harvey who will give the Blackboard talk for Mod T. So again, that will be aimed at the correlated program and the locals. So please join us for that. Um, and I think I don't have any other announcements. So thank you very much, Lucille, for a wonderful talk. Really appreciate the time and thought you put into it. And I just wish everyone to continue to stay healthy. So thank you very much. Another round of applause. Thank you.